that's about 20 years ago when I was asked to uh, to work on air pollution and in air pollution there are a lot of particles um, which is actually the quite dominant part in air pollution and uh, well that drew the attention to particle toxicology so that's 20 years ago and since then a lot of things have happened and more recently let's say the past seven years or so it also went into the area of uh, nanomaterial toxicology uh, so that's a different area but i mean they share a lot of commonalities what the challenges are at the moment um, is that we um, we, we still struggle with the way we need to test those materials. A lot of the chemicals are soluble and easy uh, to handle in, in our exposure systems. For particles, it's much more tricky to, to expose your system, whether it's a cell system, whether it's uh, volunteers, whether it's animals, uh, in a way that it's realistic, that uh, how it actually would happen in real life. Uh, you see that people tend to do exposures with substances that uh, that may be there as they are produced, but not as uh, people are exposed to, because the materials are used in products, and then you are exposed to. I mean, our, the easiest example, for instance, is sunscreen. We need to test the, the toxicology of titanium dioxide, zinc oxide as particles, but in the end you and I are exposed to sunscreen in which the materials are incorporated and that changes the, the toxic properties dramatically. The, the most obvious one is, I guess, uh, the asbestos. Asbestos is in itself not extremely toxic but it has features, uh, physical features, that makes that these fibers, which are, uh, that the fibers cause mesothelioma in lungs. And that is the length, the, the, thin, uh, the, 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 the thickness of the fiber and the persistence. Um, your body cannot break them down. And there is a, a, a sort of paradigm that a fiber should have a certain length, certain uh, thickness and um, and has a certain behavior in air. We we have that knowledge and we can extend that to uh, carbon nanotubes uh, and that's quite important for the development of safer nanomaterials and, sa and certainly safer carbon nanotubes. If they make the similar shape of fibers as asbestos they actually behave like asbestos. That has been demonstrated by colleagues in Edinburgh, uh, Professor Ken Donaldson, for instance. Um, so if you have that kind of knowledge, you can modulate the carbon nanotubes such that it will not behave as asbestos. Um, that also prevents a lot of very expensive toxicology because we have a certain paradigm that we can apply to nanomaterials. We recently had a conference in Turkey on nanotoxicology and again we saw researchers that worked on modification of carbon nanotubes such that they are recognized by cells in our body and those cells they uh, excrete uh, substances that can actually cut the fibers, make them smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, they still have the properties that the manufacturer wants. Uh, but once you are in contact with your body, then the body starts to, uh, to, to, to make them smaller and, and it's easier to excrete them again. So that's just an example. I think there, there are other examples to, to be uh, discovered pretty soon that, uh, be, the, that the, the bioperistence of nanomaterials in your body don't have to be a major issue in the, in the next, uh, next, uh, couple, uh, next decades anymore. Over the last 10 years, toxicology has dramatically developed in, in this area, yet we haven't seen 
uh, major issues about uh, uh, an exponential increase of the hazard of, of, of these materials. They are not 10 or 100 times toxic than their bulk equivalent. Um, so acute exposures would not be a, a major issue, I guess. Uh, also because there is certainly in the Western society a good hygiene in the workplace and we know a lot about the, these substances. The, the major concern would be long-term exposure to low levels. The continuous exposure, I mean, if you have nanomaterials in your diet, you eat every day uh, a certain ingredient, then it may accumulate in your body. And that's the, the major concern that we have. And to investigate that, you need a lot of money because that means that you have to do long-term exposure studies. And these are often very expensive. But uh, that's definitely something uh, which we have a lot of, a lot of concern about. Apart from long-term exposure studies, there's another issue, and that's um, the diversity of the way people assess the toxicity of nanomaterials is, is huge. We need standardization here. That may not be very attractive for academia because they want to invent something novel and then come up with very new things. But in the end, for regulators, for governments, they want to have standardized tests for assessing the hazard of nanomaterials uh, so that you can compare one study with the other and that's at this stage uh, still problematic and that's so that's the challenge.